Hello, George Romanich here. Welcome to Fundamentals of Weather and Climate Playlist. Today I will talk about the job description of a meteorologist. What do we do? Well, before I describe that and before I tell you where you can find jobs if you are a meteorologist, let's first discuss how do you get there? How do you become a meteorologist? In certain countries, typically in Europe and the rest of the world, not North America, you can already study meteorology in high school. For example, in Serbia, where I come from, I'm currently living in Canada, but I come from Serbia. In Serbia, you can go to high school to be a meteorologist. If you go to high school to be a meteorologist, you are predominantly studying how instruments work, how you do measurements, how you collect data, how you send those data uh, to national and international weather centers. Because your main job is to be the so-called meteorological technician. And that's a person that is dealing with measurements. So you're not studying that much physics of the atmosphere, various mathematical physical processes that are happening, but you get very solid understanding of how to conduct measurements and how to report these measurements. Then, if you want to become meteorologist, you have a degree in meteorology, you have to study uh, at a university. Now, at different universities, different faculties offer uh, atmospheric science or meteorology degree. Typically, it is associated with faculty of physics or faculty of natural sciences or faculty of sciences in general. At McGill University in Montreal, Canada, where I work, Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences is within the faculty of sciences. In Serbia, again, where I did my bachelor degree in atmospheric sciences, the meteorology is a group within the faculty of physics. So check your nearby university or university you want to attend to see where atmospheric sciences or meteorology or sometimes also called earth system sciences, where do they fit in your uh, university that you wish to, uh, to go. And uh, typically, as I said, that is in the departments associated with natural sciences. Then when you start studying atmospheric sciences, most of the time you will study physics, mathematics, and then in later years of your uh, study program, generally you start having very specific courses in atmospheric sciences, such as atmospheric dynamics, atmos uh, cloud microphysics, cloud dynamics, uh, radiation in the atmosphere, climate and climate dynamics, uh, natural climate change, uh, artificial or uh, sorry, anthropogenic climate change, uh, atmospheric chemistry and so on. But before that you have to have fundamentals in physics and mathematics. That's because atmospheric sciences and meteorology are extremely quantitative topics. The amount of math in uh, atmospheric sciences, if you do it properly, is equal to amount of mathematics you use in physics or uh, various fields of engineering, such as electrical, civil engineering. So we are not behind in any way. If you study hard and you finish uh, atmospheric sciences program, then you will get your diploma, which is either in atmospheric sciences or meteorology, depending how the university where you study labeled it. Now, what do we do as meteorologists? 70% of meteorologists, approximately, is working in weather prediction. That's the central theme of our field. What the weather will be like in a few hours, tomorrow, in a week, in a month, and so on. So about 70% of people that have degree in meteorology or atmospheric sciences work in weather prediction. And that's reasonable and understandable because as I just said, that's the main topic of our field. The other 30% work in various institutes and uh, firms such as, for example, airports have meteorologists, military has their own meteorologists, various transportation companies have their own meteorologists to forecast specific weather along the route where trucks, ships, airplanes go and so on. A lot of insurance companies also have meteorologists or somebody with, with associated degree because 
Weather perils are one of the main factors in insuring homes, cars, and so on. So having a person that knows meteorology and atmospheric sciences is very, very valuable to insurance companies. Then in various fields of engineering, you can find jobs, such as wind engineering. That is how winds interact with structures. Now, in that case, you have to study a little bit about structural engineering as well, but you have to have very strong, solid fundamentals of atmospheric sciences. Then in wind energy, how wind turbines produce electricity, but more importantly, what is the wind resource that the wind turbines can use to produce that, in, uh, that electricity. So wind resource assessment is heavily dependent on strong knowledge of atmospheric sciences and meteorology. Then solar power is also important. Then in water resources as well. In water resources, uh, it's very important to know precipitation. What is the climatology of precipitation over certain region? Is it gonna change? How is it gonna affect, uh, for example, uh, hydropower plants and so on. So you can also find jobs there. But in that case, you see, you have to broaden your knowledge and not just be strictly atmospheric science researcher or meteorologist, but you have to know now a little bit about water resources, energy and so on. But that's a good news. You should strive to study something all your life. You should never stop. As Professor Julius Sumner Miller said, one of my heroes, you will live maybe 70, 80, 90 years if every day you learn one new thing, don't you agree you will have a huge, vast amount of knowledge at the end of your life and then you die? The other op option for uh, meteorologists and atmospheric science researchers is to stay in academia and do research. I am assistant professor in the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences at McGill University. On a daily basis, I do research, my own research, I supervise my graduate and undergraduate students to, so that they can do their research. I teach undergraduate and graduate level courses and I collaborate with other researchers in my department and across the world and Canada and so on. But in that case, you have to have affinity towards research. You have to be, let's just be honest, among the best in your class because you're supposed to teach next generation of atmospheric scientists and meteorologists, so you should be very good uh, meteorologist on your own. Then there are various institutes where you can find job. These institutes typically uh, only focus on research and some specific research. For example, uh, National Storm Prediction Center in the United States. Well, just when I tell you name, you can conclude they are mostly dealing with storms and thunderstorms and severe weather associated with thunderstorms. Other research centers that specialize on climate or oceanography deal with these topics. And again, you have to probably have master's or PhD degree because they are specialized in research. Uh, now, each country pretty much has their own uh, weather forecasting center. They have different names. And then we also have regional forecasting centers. The state of the art in forecasting today is what the Americans and the Europeans are doing, namely European Weather, uh, Euro European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting in uh, England and uh, American Forecast uh, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration in the United States. They have huge amount of people, resources that are working on forecasting weather, climate and also do research. I would also like to emphasize at the end of this video that whether you are doing operational forecast or you are doing research, coding and programming is very important and it is becoming more and more important. So you better be good at Fortran because that's traditional language that we use for coding numerical models because they are heavy mathematically and Fortran is still the best mathematical tool out there, the most efficient, but in addition to Fortran, you should be good at Python and or MATLAB, C++, some other uh, programming languages. And of course, machine learning is, is becoming more and more uh, sexy topic in atmospheric sciences. So you don't necessarily have to be good at machine learning to know to be a meteorologist, but if you want to follow recent trends and you maybe want to do research in that, then you should also know about machine learning. 
So I hope I uh, demystified here what is a meteorologist, what do we do, where you can find jobs. And finally, on a personal level, why should you study atmospheric sciences? I am biased, of course, but I think there is no better field to study in atmospheric sciences. First of all, you know mathematics and physics. That's the language of this beautiful universe. But more importantly than that, you study mathematics and physics applied to the atmosphere. And atmosphere is the greatest laboratory we have on this planet. You and I are walking down the street in this laboratory. You sleep, you eat, everything you do is in the atmosphere. Why wouldn't you know how the atmosphere works? Why the wind blows? Why do you have clouds? Why do you have these particular clouds? How does it rain? Of course, you don't have to know. You can go through life without knowing it. But why wouldn't you? If you have choice to know one thing in natural sciences, shouldn't that be the laboratory in which you live? Shouldn't that be the atmosphere? If you disagree, let me know in the comment section below, what do you think is the most important field of study related to earth sciences and your everyday life? Until next video, goodbye.